This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Jeffrey Zilks, Tony Glass, and Philip Less. Coming up on DTNS, why is Google's Bard having such a hard time keeping up? Atari beefs up its game title selection. And what does the future of AI mean for humanity? Researcher Ruby Justice Thelo shares thoughts with us. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, April 20th, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland of the Ohio, I'm Rich Trafalino. From Petaluma, I'm Megan Maroney. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Che. Megan Maroney, we're so glad to have you back on the show. Welcome. I am glad to be back. Uh, it was nice to see your beautiful face and uh, in real life. The last time I was on the show, we actually got to see each other and breathe each other's air. It was amazing. We did. Megan and I saw each other IRL. It doesn't happen that often these days, turns out. And the rest of you, you know, we'll just stay remote. Uh, but uh, <laughs> before we get into the quick hits real quick, Twitter has begun removing blue check marks from legacy verified accounts. Mine was included. So I am no longer verified unless I want to pay $8 a month, which I don't. Twitter said it previously no. promised to do this, so not a big surprise, but you never know with Twitter these days. Let's get into more quick hits. The chip shortage from the last few years has done a bit of a 180. TSMC forecasts that chip revenue this quarter will be worse than expected due to drops in demand for its chips across sectors from phones to servers. TSMC says it expects a continued decline in the second quarter, then improvement coming in the second half of the year. But it's not just TSMC. Bloomberg reports that Taiwanese export orders dropped 25.7% in March, and orders for tech components like semiconductors fell 29.4%. That is the largest fall in 14 years. Microsoft announced that starting April 25th, its multi-platform smart ads product will no longer include Twitter as one of the platforms. Now, Unless you're running internet ads all the time, you may be asking, what is that? The tool lets customers manage multiple paid ad campaigns, including on Google, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn from a single interface and used to support Twitter too. Microsoft will also remove Twitter from its social media management tool for advertisers called Digital Marketing Center. The decision seems to be a response to Twitter's increased API fees. Amazon announced that it launched its Anti-Counterfeiting Exchange, or ACX, designed to help retail stores label and track marketplace counterfeits. This is part of Amazon's efforts to crack down on organized crime on its platform by mimicking data exchange platforms in the credit card industry to find scammers and then identify their tactics. Individual stores and Amazon marketplace sellers can both contribute information and record anonymously to flag counterfeiters in a third-party database or use the database to avoid doing business with shady partners in the future. Snap is releasing its My AI chatbot for free to all Snapchat users. The bot is powered by OpenAI's models and was previously available to paid Snapchat subscribers, Snapchat Plus uh, subscribers. My AI can also be added to group chats by mentioning it, and you can change the name and use a custom Bitmoji for it as well if you just want to make it a little bit more personal. My AI does things like recommend filters or suggest places to visit. It'll soon get the ability to respond with images as well. And Snap CEO Evan Spiegel said he has used My AI to do things like create bedtime stories for his children. OK, and plan birthday activities for his wife. In other Snap News, they also opened its their revenue sharing program for public stories content to all creators. As long as you have 50,000 followers and 25 million monthly views, uh, I was previously limited to select creators. The share from these re uh, this shares revenue from ads that run between a user's stories content and finishing up our trio of Snap News here at the Snap Partner Summit. Kara Swisher asked uh, Evan Spiegel if he thinks TikTok should be banned. And he said, we love that, but added it would be a dangerous precedent. Google announced it merged its two main artificial intelligence research units, Brain and DeepMind, into a single unit, which will now be called Google DeepMind. The unit will be led by Demis Hassabis, who is the co-founder and CEO of DeepMind. Google purchased DeepMind for about $500 million ooh, in 2014, which sounds like a steal with numbers these days. <laughs> 
All right, Rich, let's talk more about the future of AI. The future and how it's going to be built on, right. Uh, since Google opened up its Bard chatbot last month, comparisons to other chatbots, maybe specifically uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT, have been less than kind uh, if you look at the aggregate. Now Bloomberg sources say Google employees have been well aware of issues with Bard. There are some pretty juicy quotes in the piece, including someone calling the system a pathological liar and another calling it worse than useless. Uh, generally, everybody was recommending Google maybe delay releasing it, and that, or some engineers were saying uh, maybe Google should delay releasing it. Google ended up still going forward. Of course, when it comes to BARD, ChatGPT, or really any other large language models or LLMs, these all require massive corpus of a massive corpus of text to train on. So what's in these data sets is pretty important. It's how LLMs learn what words to string together in response to a user query. If it's really smart autocomplete, it's how it figures out what to autocomplete. To understand these data sets better, the reporters at the Washington Post and researchers at the Allen Institute for AI analyzed Google's colossal clean crawled corpus, or much boringly referred to as C4 data set, which includes content from 15 million websites. Sarah, what were they looking at? What'd they find? <laughs> so, okay. So looking at the site tokens, I'm only laughing because some of these naming conventions, you got to <laughs> do something better than this. But okay, that's a different topic for another time. Looking at the site tokens, the post found that the most frequently cited sites were patents.google.com, Wikipedia, and the subscription-only library, Scribed. Google filtered this content before using it for training using the open source list of dirty, naughty, obscene, and otherwise bad words. Basically, you know, just trying to get the bad stuff out of there so people don't get, or, you know, did, uh, unsavory content or don't try to make it give them unsavory content. And there are other filters as well. However, the post found hundreds of pornographic sites and other sites asso associated with things like hate groups uh, that were escaping the filter. So speaking of research, Megan, you've done a lot on this topic. So, uh, you know, of, of what we've uh, laid out here, what stands out to you about what's being handled well versus what isn't? Well, I am, uh, I'm super fascinated with this because it's the first time I've really felt like AI is about to steal my job and it probably will. Um, but what's fascinating about what the Washington Post looked at, they really like looked deep into the words that the, the sites that these generative AI tools are using to, to produce this content. And it's amazing. And there's so many interesting things. And with AI, like, so often it's like we're scared of the wrong things. Um, first of all, like the, the copyright symbol appeared more than 200 million times in the data set, which is just interesting to me because, you know, like if you've used any of this generative AI, it's not telling you that things are copyrighted. It's just giving you like an essay on Twelfth Night or writing, you know, a press release or like just doing any of your work for you and it's not saying any of it is copyrighted um like you said it's you know it's it's some sites that are questionable kiwi farm stormfront 4chan those those sites weren't blocked and you know but some of the problems that uh, that they were they saw are just problems that have been around for you know decades when we're talking about like the internet for example like it could be blocking some non-sexual lgbtq content which i know like parental controls have been having that problem forever like someone is mm -hmm. honestly looking for like sexual health information and it's blocked because because it's associated with those like that long list of dirty words or, or some you know faulty thing that they put in there. Um, I think what's interesting too is not necessarily what um, data it's scraping because a lot of this is just, I mean, it's Google. We're talking about Google, so they've been scraping this information for a long time, but it's how the AI is using it. So for example, like, I mean, some people are sometimes surprised to know that voter registration is public, but it's, you know, it is, it's public. You can look and see how, um, you know, what party people are affiliated with. Um, mm -hmm. But so scraping that info is one thing but like then these models could use it in very unknown ways like if you ask for like oh I need a biography on Sarah Lane like it might include your Democratic Party you know I mean your part your not your your Democratic it, it's might, fine it, whatever party <laughs> who knows Sarah yeah. I don't know I know I you know you, you would never once guess um but yeah well, no, that, never, no yeah. that's a that's a really good example though uh, and I think uh, the fact that this is public data, so there's nothing inherently wrong with that, 
but then is it going to be used to describe me in another way, in a way where I was like, hmm, well, that's not, you know, I wouldn't have shared that kind of data willingly, you know, in a blog post or that sort of thing. But it's also, I think, you know, I think a lot, uh, what a lot of people, myself included, are still wrapping their heads around is, you know, the data that is collected is not stored somewhere. You know, like these models aren't just like, you know, you know, um, uh, amassing, you know, terabytes, uh, petabytes of, of data. It, they're simply trying to learn what, what should probably be said about a particular person. For example, myself, maybe I, you know, I, I lean in a certain way politically. Does that say something more about me based on the other data that has been collected? And that's what these models do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's the kind of the whole other issue that we're, we, you know, and Megan, you were talking about this one and we we're talking about like data that's public, like voter registration. Very specifically over in Europe, uh, the training sets for large language models are really becoming like a, a super big deal. You know, we've talked about on this show, you know, Italy is is ordering open AI to stop processing data and they have a deadline of April 30th. Uh, to meet uh, some demands to make sure that they're not violating GDPR protections uh, over there. And it's some pretty serious stuff. I and mean, we're talking about like p potentially getting consent for people to have their data in those data sets for to scrape that data, meeting right to be forgotten rules, like really tricky stuff. And it's not, you know, it's not just the Italians on a lark here. Regulators in France, Germany, and Ireland are also looking into uh, open AI data collection specifically. And in fact, the European Data Protection Board has set up a GPT-3 specific task force to kind of coordinate on this. So I don't think any of these are going away. And it kind of speaks to this idea that uh, under GDPR and, and its protections, you know, there, there is kind of a difference between data that is public and data that can be, you know, kind of used just because it's public. I mean, it doesn't mean you can use it, uh, you know, without consent. Uh, and it's it's a very it's a very different regime and a very di very different set of criteria uh, that we're seeing in Europe for sure. Mm -hmm. I think also just the fact that um, we don't know what the accuracy, like so many people, because the, the way the whole, like when you put something into ChatGPT or Bard, like it just the way it like types it up and it looks like magic and it's, you know, you, you think it sounds right. And so mm -hmm. when you think about where this data comes from, like, so it, it ranked, the, you know, ranked all these sites to, in terms of subjects. So like in, in technology, Medium is ranked 56 in tech content. And, you know, full disclosure, I used to work for Medium. And that's part of how I know that most of it is unedited, unfact-checked, user-generated content. Like, and so, mm -hmm. you know, th there might be a lot on Medium that is from a very, um, you know, well-known source. It might, some, some stuff is fact-checked, some stuff was edited, but not everything. And so, and I'm not sure that there's a way for this data set to really know um, in a way that it needs to, the way we're using it to know what, what is accurate, especially if this is ranked as the 56 in tech content. Well, and yeah. to that point, and to that point, like I was really surprised to see how, how how much personal blogs in general, like not you know, like just you know your your everyday blog were scraped and used for this. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I'm sure there was a lot of content there, but again, that's like deeply personal in some ways. That's performative in ways that you might not get from a, from a news site or from Wikipedia or something like that. And that may you know, again, all of these are 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 put together to train these models to. Uh, you know, generate, pr predict what text is going to generate and give you like a desirable response. But it, th the fact that that's so deeply personal stuff and also not scraping like the major social media platforms, things like Facebook and Twitter, uh, it, it gives it a very specific, I feel like performative set also to, to build off of. Um, and, and speaking of accuracy, yeah, I mean, these, I mean, that's the thing we, we keep having to repeat is like these models have no idea that they're even like supposed to like accuracy is not the goal of them. It's the goal is to have like a convincing response. Like accuracy is beside the point almost with these models in a lot of ways. Yeah, the models don't care about accuracy. The models, that's not the model doesn't know what that is. The yeah. model says, this is what I have to work with. And this is probably the sentence that makes the most sense based on what I have to work with. Yeah. And yeah, you know, Medium, great example. I mean, not everybody is posting like super personal stuff on Medium. I'm a person who've, who's posted some super personal stuff on Medium as of late, you know, like health things. I could have just made up a bunch of stuff. And would that be part of, you know, the, you know, the, the data that becomes 
um, something that uh, it's trained on and spits out to somebody else so that that next person now is like, "Mm, sounds like it's true. I mean, that happens all the time. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about AI and who to trust and who not to trust in just a sec. But just a reminder that you can join our conversation in our Discord. We'd love to have you there. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, on the latest episode of A Word with Tom Merritt, Tom talked with cyber ethnography researcher and writer Ruby Justice Thalo about humanity's place in an age of AI-enabled technologies. Where do we humans fit in? We have an excerpt from that conversation focusing on how people evaluate the veracity or truthfulness of information that they find on the internet. So let's listen in now. I am very... The idea that you would get information and that information would be just 100% true is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. You know, usually if you grew up before the internet, your research wouldn't, you know, probably check a book or two to get some information. And there was some, at least a little breath in how we acquire knowledge. And we've been primed really to go on one place and go and find one piece of information and be like, okay, this is Wikipedia. This is true. I even remember when Wikipedia came out, mm. the teachers being like, oh, don't trust Wikipedia. You still got to go to Encarta or whatever, <laughs> the, the library. Or Botanica or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was a big thing because they, people were maybe, they didn't believe that they're cold. They could be only a single source of truth, especially on the internet. And so I think we've carried over that assumption that, if something that has the stamp of Microsoft mm-hmm. or that is a, a something we see on the news, why would somebody put something out that lies? You know, <laughs> that, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's wrong to expect that as a consumer, um, even if they say, oh, it's not always going to be correct. The last paper that I read, I think it was for the Lambda, the Google, the Google system, had about 80 percent groundedness, which means 80 percent veracity. You mm-hmm. have similar things with GPT-3 and GPT-4. So four things out of five are going to be true. One out of five gonna be probably a hallucination as they call it yeah yeah that's a lot actually no when you think about that's a lot one out of five but i think we expect on the internet to be served at the very least a semblance of truth and if it's not truth it's ideologically correct you know no that's that's a great point that I, I don't know what the average veracity of my average conversation with my neighbors is, but I wouldn't be shocked if it was around 80%. You know, I, I definitely hear people saying wrong things all the time. I, I know I've said things that I'm like, oh, that turned out to be wrong. But we're, we're more forgiving in that interpersonal relationship than we are with the machine. And, and it, I, 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 I was really fascinated by what you said about the authority, right? It, oh, it's coming from a machine. We give it extra authority. Is that something we can get over? Is that something we just need to untrain ourselves from? Or is it just endemic and, and we need to adapt to it differently? The truth of the matter is, is that we see the internet as this repository of knowledge. And Mm -hmm. when we ask a machine that is connected to the internet a question, we assume it can go and retrieve that information. That's just, that's one of the affordances of the internet is that a lot of knowledge is on it. And through Google, whatever, you can access that knowledge. I think it's, you know, speaking as a designer, it's a bit of a design flaw, right? In the same way that a cigarette package would have indication on you know what the risk or dangers might be there may be some more salient features or more salient design as to the fact that it is a tool in testing this is not a factual you know what they the, what the ai says is not factual they say it a little bit you know it says in the fine print it, it, yeah. it says a little bit but it's not it, it is not a prominent feature of the design of the interface of these programs it's not a habit for us yet I guess that's what I'm yes. wondering is like, can we, can we turn it into a habit of like, oh no, that's, that's, that's a chatbot. Of course I don't trust everything it says. I, there's something about also the maybe post fake news moment where these two things might converge and push us to a culture of double checking. Mm-hmm. We spend the last, you know, six, since um seven years, since um, um 
the election of 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 Trump just being well aware that things or the media or by the way that was the case before that as well but it became salient yeah. in the magnifying mask got put on it yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. that um the things we read were not always sure and people became very adamant about you know uh, saying got the fact checkers and there's a whole choreography of mm -hmm. people looking at things that people say to make sure that they were true and potentially one of the positive effects of that is that if we identify as a culture that both the information we get from the media might be wrong and the information we get from the internet might be wrong and the information we get from AI chatbots might be wrong, might push us to a culture of double checking, verifying. But of course the onus is on the user yeah. and the user is a person with limited amount of time. And one can assume that they will only check things that are super important to them. That whole conversation just made me like my, I, my handle is Mr. Anthropology. So that just talking about these tools being used in culture, like this whole conversation is just fantastic. But what what got this really got me thinking is that to that point, I remember that in college, too, of I've had professors tell me, like, in your bibliography, do not put Wikipedia, do not even start with Wikipedia. Like that was a moment when we as a like just even in an academic culture, we're learning to like how to use this resource of the internet uh, at that time. And so to, to, to think about ChatGPT in that way, it can seem so disruptive and it may very well be extraordinarily disruptive long term. But like this is also it, the same way a cell phone is, the same way a smartphone or, or computers or whatever. Like these are cultural products that like it's going to take some time to do that. But mm -hmm. this conversation kind of gave me, I don't know, some hope. Uh, that, you know, like culture is extraordinarily resilient to these sorts of things. I I'm curious, Megan, like uh, what, what did this kind of get going in your brain? Well, I mean, definitely made me think about how we just spent the last 15 minutes talking about how inaccurate it was and like just the fact that like a lot is inaccurate and it always has been before. Like I went to college long before Wikipedia. So, you know, we were checking like we were sourcing from books in the library. And I think <laughs> Do as a journalist, woo woo. <laughs> yeah. Library like, as a tons, journalist, please. like I exactly. I I mean, part of what I do every day is, you know, like with my reporters, like where did this come from? Where was this sourced? According to who? Like, you know, the job of a journalist is to collect facts and then put them together and you know tell the person what's important. And I feel like that is absolutely not what Chat GPT or any generative AI can do. Like they just can't do that. So I, I think that that's what's scary because it just feels like there's no sourcing, no one. So it's not necessarily the inaccuracy; it's the lack of saying where you got that fact or like a journalist's name. The byline is there. You know, like everybody knows the words I'm speaking, the words we're you know speaking on the show are all coming from us. And you know, with a, it, just it. I don't know. I'm. I, I don't want to be all like, ah, get off my lawn, chat GPT, <laughs> but it, that is kind of what I'm saying. It, it is really interesting, though, that as we see this kind of generative AI get into industry, certainly, like even just like the, the open AI integrations that we're seeing, these verticals that we're seeing with Microsoft stuff, we are seeing sourcing being much more important. Like, I, I still like I, I still just like want to like say like ChatGPT is like the tech demo for how this stuff works. And like we're not even be, we're just starting to see like the idea of this at scale. And when we have seen this at scale, like when we see it in business, in industry, we are like I, I I and I'm not saying that this will in any way be perfect or and that we will not fall down on our faces on this, but like sourcing is a big part of that. Probably we need to do I don't know much better, but it is interesting to see that when like hey it's being used for business for specific business products, sourcing is at least a little bit part of that conversation that we're seeing right now. Indeed. Well, if you want to hear the rest of that interview, be sure to head on over to a word podcast, the letter a word podcast.com to get the full episode of a word with Tom Merritt and his conversation with Ruby justice fellow. If you love Tom, you love him getting into deep conversations with cool people on fascinating topics. I have a feeling that you might, if you're listening to this show, probably want to check it out. I know I'd love it. Check it out. I do too. I mean, this is Tom and his element. You know, Tom <laughs> is great at this sort of stuff. Um, you know who's also great at stuff? Atari. And that stuff is buying things back. The company announced it acquired more than 100 PC and console titles launched in the 1980s and the 1990s from companies like Micropose, Infro Games. 
infograms, rather, and Accolade, also adding Accolade's trademark to its vault. Now, you might say, well, hold on, didn't some of these games, you know, weren't they already Atari games? Yeah, so Atari now owns the Demolition Racer series, Bubsby, Hardball, and some of these were Atari titles at one point. IP has moved around, companies buy things from other folks, so it's a coming home of sorts. Last month, Atari also snagged Night Drive Studios and the IPs of 12 Stern Electronics arcade classics, including Berserk and Frenzy. Atari plans to re-release already existing games on modern consoles and create new adaptations of past storylines. Who's into it? (laughs) (laughs) I I love this idea that Atari is this very specific, like amalgam, like it's this aggregator of IP that had value in a, in a very, it feels like a very narrow window. I know some of these, these titles go into the nineties, but like, you know, we are thinking like, like hardball or, or, you know, uh, demolition race or that kind of stuff. Like seems like a very specific amount of time. They've kind of, they're like, this is our lane. This is what we're going to do. If people think Atari, they think of a wood panel console that was sitting under your giant CRT uh, TV. So, like, like the name Atari is so synonymous with that. I think it's smart that whatever the incarnation of this company, it, it's kind of doubling down on that. That makes it's sense. Like, it's me. it's like the vinyl community, right? Like Atari's kind of like, listen, we, you know, we know that some of you, not all of, you know, not every gamer, but 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 many gamers, especially of a certain age, really care about this stuff. There's nostalgia. It you know it, it invokes emotion, and to have it under the Atari uh, Atari umbrella makes a lot of sense to me. All right. Well, let's check out the mailbag and see what y'all have been saying. Uh, We got one from Samir. This is based on our conversation about AI and drones helping kill weeds in farms uh, yesterday with Scott Johnson. Samir says, first time feedbacker. So thank you, Samir. Uh, Please do, you know, keep it up. Samir says, I think a great use for this tech in your last episode would be to spray paint where spots are found or to clean buildings outdoors, glass or otherwise where needed. Um, Samir's obviously talking about the idea that, that the precision of a you know drone that is trained on how a farm would work could also work for yeah like a skyscraper or you know a, a building that needs just a little bit of paint. The whole thing doesn't need to be painted, but just a little bit of paint, um, and that's a really good really good use case for this as well. Send out the paint drones. Yeah, I kind of kind of love that. Uh, the other thing I, I really love is Stephen wrote in, and he had some thoughts about AI and using it for accessibility. Uh, and so he wrote in and said, "I'm a blind. I, I'm blind, and I use audio descriptions where available. However, due to licensing issues and the fact that it's a very niche area, the amount of content somewhat limited." This is there is a surprising amount of content with audio descriptions available. You know, he says, to be fair, sometimes it's available, but not on a particular platform or maybe just not just this time around. For example, he says you could find a film with audio descriptions on one streaming platform one year, and then it goes away. And when it comes back, it doesn't have it anymore and vice versa. So my plan was to see how well AI, chat GPT in this instance, would do well at writing descriptive scripts for a blind audience. He did some testing. I had to go. He said his first attempt, not bad. Missed all of my favorite bits, but still not bad at all. And then in his second attempt, he said ChatGPT did the thing where it just makes stuff up. But I think I like the AI version better. So, all right. <laughs> so maybe we could feed that into once we have text to video, we can feed the good one that ChatGPT did, and then we can get a video. And the, the snake will fully I, eat itself. Well, you know, text to video exists, but yes, yeah, I'm sorry, has a long but... way to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> long way to go. When we're covering the first feature film next year, I'll. Uh... <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It was this really Michael Mann, or was it AI? <laughs> no one knows yet. Let's hear from the director himself. Uh, uh, well. Boom-boom. <laughs> while we're waiting for that to happen we want to thank you megan maroney for being with us on the show today let folks know what you're up to these days well i am freelancing mostly and uh i am working currently at hr brew which is part of morning brew or newsletter company um and uh my content that i'm editing is uh, mostly about workplace issues so Anybody who is in HR or is like a, you know, kind of working in a company where you're the person in charge of dealing with all of the issues of return to work and, um, you know, just everything, whether people. 
Yes, whether you should <laughs> use ChatGPT and the it for work, all those things. So um, check it out. I think uh, you would like it. Um, there's lots of gifs. Ooh. <laughs> also gifs. Also known as gifts. Either you way, know? I'm so. Uh, yeah, listen. <laughs> uh, our brand new bosses, of which there are three, who might say gif or jif, we don't know yet, but what we do know is that they are Ernest, Adonis, and Bead. And they just started backing us on Patreon, and Ooh. that really made our day. Thank yeah. you, Ernest. Thank you, Adonis. Thank you, Beat. And Adonis, Ernest, and Bede, and all our other patrons, remember to stick around. I implore you for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We'll be talking about BuzzFeed News, pouring some out for it because it's shutting down and how that plays into other recent newsroom shutdowns. So stay tuned. Just a reminder, you can catch our show, DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Len Peralta drawing the top tech stories and Rob Dunwood talking tech with us. Don't miss it. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>